people in the area have heard rumblings for like a long time. Sure. This is like maybe next level and the unknown piece of it is what's scary. As lovely as Yellowstone National Park's hot springs, geysers, and lavish landscape are, they are only made possible by the menacing supervolcano that lurks beneath the surface. This is a deadly supervolcano that, should it explode, may have catastrophic consequences for the entire world. Yes, a supervolcano that has the power to cover the United States in ash and plunge the entire planet into a volcanic winter is hidden underneath Yellowstone National Park taking its time to destroy us all. Is an eruption of the Yellowstone supervolcano actually due? Is there anything we can do to avoid its destructive awakening? Join us as we explore why Yellowstone volcano might blow up anytime soon. One of the largest volcanoes in the world lies hidden beneath Yellowstone National Park a sizable area of breathtaking wildness that receives about 3 million visitors each year. Since the Yellowstone caldera, the cauldron-like basin at the volcano's peak is so enormous, it is frequently referred to as a supervolcano. To put that into perspective, consider that the Pinatubo eruption in the Philippines in 1991, which is considered to be the most powerful volcanic explosion in recent memory, was rated a 6 on the Volcanic Explosivity Index making it around 100 times smaller than the standard for a supervolcano. The Yellowstone supervolcano's magma chamber has occasionally erupted throughout history. The last eruption at Pitchstone Plateau took place about 70,000 years ago, and the vast, great bulk of those eruptions in Yellowstone have been smaller lava flows. The remote prospect of catastrophic super-eruptions, defined as any eruption with a magnitude of 8 or higher on the Volcano Explosivity Index, and an ejection volume of at least 240 cubic miles is what draws so much attention to Yellowstone. That would bury Texas five feet beneath the surface. Even the largest eruptions we are accustomed to are thousands of times less powerful than these super eruptions. In its history, Yellowstone has had three of these extraordinarily large eruptions, 2.1 million years ago, 1.3 million years ago, and 664,000 years ago. The last of these, at Yellowstone Lava Creek, ejected enough material from below to leave a 34-mile by 50-mile hole in the ground, which we now know as the Yellowstone Caldera. Geologists have discovered evidence of at least 47 super-eruptions throughout Earth's history. Therefore, Yellowstone is not the only supervolcano in the world. The most recent took place about 26,000 years ago at Lake Taupo in New Zealand. More significantly, the tectonic plate movement led to the enormous Toba eruption that occurred 74,000 years ago. According to others, this precipitated a severe 6-10 to 10 year global winter and may have all but wiped off the human species. Although it's not an unbreakable rule, the Earth has typically experienced one super eruption every 100,000 years. Volcanoes cannot be overdue for an eruption since they don't erupt on a timetable or at regular intervals. Consequently, what triggers eruptions at volcanoes like Yellowstone? We require a kind of black box recorder that can describe the events leading up to previous eruptions and how long they lasted in order to provide an answer to this question. Fortunately, we have created exactly such a recorder over the past 10, 15 years. That is crystals, crystals. You might find that surprising. How are things recorded in crystals and what connection do they have to volcanoes? Volcanoes spew out a mixture of gas, liquid magma, and crystals that have grown in the magma chamber as they erupt. The crystals later become a component of lava flows during less explosive eruptions or ash deposits during more violent ones. Similar to the rings in trees, the crystals in the deposits from both large and small eruptions in Yellowstone's history have concentric zones. We can also rebuild the climate in the magma chamber as the crystal formed using the data recorded in these zones. They specifically inform us about alterations in temperature, pressure, and chemical composition that occurred in the years preceding previous eruptions. The youngest zones, or those closest to the crystal's edge, provide information about the conditions in the magma chamber just before the eruption. Numerous events, 
including the transfer of magma from a deeper storage region to the shallowest one beneath the volcano or the mixing of two different types of magma, can result in an eruption in the magmatic system beneath volcanoes. Crystals found in lava flows that erupted around 256,000 years ago, as well as deposits from Yellowstone's most recent major eruption, the Lava Creek Tuff, tell us that the pressure caused by the passage of magma from a deeper storage zone to a shallower one was sufficient to trigger an eruption. We know that the Yellowstone magma system stretches from the base of the Earth's crust to the surface based on the propagation of seismic waves. Therefore, it is not all that strange that magma is moving from a deeper storage region to a shallow one. It took several decades between the time the crystals first noticed the magma movement and the eruption in both instances, the explosion and the lava flow. This is only the beginning, it's not the end. To verify these findings, further information is required. To ensure that the findings are reliable, some investigations will be carried out, for instance, on a number of the previous eruptions at Yellowstone. However, based just on these two eruptions, one large and one smaller, it appears that Yellowstone's eruptions are the result of a common process. Therefore, it is plausible that if Yellowstone were to erupt once more, the eruption would be brought on by a similar migration of magma from deeper in the crust to the shallowest magma chamber. This is something that would be simple to detect because such a movement of magma would result in significant ground deformation, far greater than the few inches per year of uplift or subsidence that are typically seen. Major earthquake swarms, much different and more vigorous than what we see normally, and possibly even changes in gas or thermal emissions. It's not difficult to understand why the Yellowstone supervolcano continues to be a never-ending source of apocalyptic curiosity. Each year, the area experiences between 1,000 and 2,000 detectable earthquakes as a result of volcanic and tectonic activity. Most only have a magnitude of three or less, making them quite insignificant. An earthquake swarm is a situation in which many earthquakes are detected in a brief period of time. Over a number of months in 1985, more than 3,000 earthquakes were recorded. Between 1983 and 2008, more than 70 smaller swarms were discovered. According to the USGS, slippage on pre-existing faults are more likely to be to blame for these swarms than magma or hydrothermal fluid movements. Over a seven-day period in December 2008 and January 2009, more than 500 earthquakes were recorded beneath Yellowstone Lake's northwest end with the greatest one with a magnitude of 3.9. After the earthquake in Haiti and before the earthquake in Chile, a new swarm began in January 2010. Between January 17th and February 1st, 2010, there were 1,620 little earthquakes, making this swarm the second largest one to be noted in the Yellowstone caldera. The largest of these shocks occurred on January 21st, 2010, and it had a magnitude of 3.8. By February 21st, this swarm had diminished to background levels, the strongest earthquake to be recorded in Yellowstone since February 1980, with a magnitude of 4.8, occurred there on March 30, 2014. More than 300 earthquakes occurred in February 2018, with the strongest measuring magnitude 2.9. The Yellowstone Caldera's Lava Creek eruption, which took place 640,000 years ago, spewed over 1,000 cubic kilometers, 240 cubic miles, of rock, dust, and volcanic ash into the atmosphere. As a proxy for changes in magma chamber pressure, geologists constantly monitor the height of the Yellowstone Plateau, which has been increasing at a rate of up to 5.9 inches every year. Since such studies first started in 1923, the upward displacement of the Yellowstone caldera floor between 2004 and 2008, almost 3.0 inches each year, was more than three times larger than ever recorded. At the White Lake GPS station, the land surface within the caldera rose up to 8 inches between 2004 and 2008. The USGS reported that the uplift of the Yellowstone caldera has slowed significantly in January 2010, and that uplift is still occurring, but at a reduced rate. So what might a super eruption in Yellowstone look like? The most likely eruption scenario for Yellowstone is a minor eruption that resulted in lava flows, 
and might potentially create a normal volcanic explosion, similar to what is currently occurring at Iceland's Berarbunga. As the magma rose to the surface, this would probably be caused by a cluster of earthquakes in a particular area of the park. Now, the warning indicators would be considerably more obvious in the event of a much larger supereruption. The entire park would certainly experience strong earthquake activity at first. Before an eruption, it might take those earthquakes weeks or months to fracture the rocks above the magma. What if we had a super eruption, which was 1,000 times more powerful than a typical volcanic eruption, spewed at least 240 cubic miles of material, lasted weeks or months, and was characterized by prolonged activity? Within the park, the lava flows themselves would be restricted to a circumference of about 40 kilometers. In actuality, only about one-third of the material would enter the atmosphere. Volcanic ash, a mixture of shattered rock and glass, which was thrown kilometers into the air and dispersed throughout the nation, would cause the majority of the damage. An eruption would produce an even, all-pervasive umbrella cloud. The northern Rockies may theoretically be covered in three feet of ash by a super-eruption, which would obliterate major portions of Wyoming, Idaho, Colorado, Montana, and Utah. A few inches of ash would fall on the Midwest at the same time, and much less would fall on the coasts. The precise distribution would be based on the season and the weather. Any of those possibilities would be awful news. That much volcanic ash has the potential to destroy buildings as well as harm people, plants, and animals. Even a few inches of ash, which is what much of the nation is capable of receiving, can ruin farms, clog roads, lead to life-threatening respiratory issues, obstruct sewer systems, and even short out transformers. Most of North America would have to stop using airplanes. A large-scale volcanic eruption would also have significant impacts on the world's climate. Sulfur aerosols released by volcanoes can reflect sunlight back into the atmosphere, lowering temperatures. The impact is just momentary because these particles have a short atmospheric lifetime, yet they can still be very noticeable. When Pinatubo erupted in 1991, it temporarily lowered Earth's temperature by around 1 degree Celsius. A few regions may have experienced famines as a result of the Tambora eruption in 1815, which caused enough cooling to harm crops all over the world. And compared to what a supervolcano is, in principle capable of, those eruptions were really little. The supervolcano beneath Yellowstone National Park will cause damage to structures, suffocate crops, and shut down power stations. It would be a terrible calamity. What are the chances of a super eruption in Yellowstone? There are currently no indications of an impending eruption. Although there are still earthquakes in Yellowstone Park and the ground is still rising and falling, this is nothing unusual. Super eruptions will occur on Earth in the future, but will Yellowstone experience any of them? Indeed, volcanoes eventually fade out. The heat rising from below and the relative cold from the surface are two opposing forces acting on the magma chamber beneath Yellowstone. The chamber might theoretically freeze and finally transform into a solid granite body if the heat from below is reduced. Additionally, it's important to keep in mind that the volcanic hotspot beneath Yellowstone is progressively moving to the northeast, or, more precisely, that the North American tectonic plate is moving southwest over the hotspot. If enough time passes, the hotspot will leave Yellowstone's foundation, and the supervolcano there will presumably cease to exist. A fact, a second supervolcano could form much farther to the northeast, but that wouldn't happen until the hotspot warmed up and melted the crust. And it can take a million years or longer for that to happen. Although Yellowstone's supervolcano has been thoroughly researched by scientists, there isn't much we can do to stop it if or when it erupts again. Even so, NASA is still working to develop a preventative measure for the next supervolcano eruption. Scientists have assumed that humanity will have millennia to prepare for the catastrophic eruption when Yellowstone's supervolcano starts to rattle and its magma chambers fill. Recent research indicates that the volcano can fill its magma chamber and erupt within a few decades, nevertheless. As a result, the Yellowstone supervolcano may begin to erupt in the 2030s instead of continuing to function as usual. 
a supervolcano like Yellowstone will eventually erupt, bringing about the next ice age and maybe wiping out much of Earth's life. However, NASA has a plan to prevent this from happening. Nature is one of the few forces that can put us in our place even with all of our technology and toys today. However, as humankind gains a better understanding of these extraordinary forces, and as the power of our technology increases, we are gradually redressing the balance. Planet-killing space rock, exploited, exploded, and refined into a spaceship. Doomsday tsunami, soundproofed out of existence, rising sea levels due to Arctic ice melting, refrozen and halted, continental-wide desertification? Let it rain. Great, humanity has once more been rescued. The Earth might enter another ice age as a result of a supervolcano eruption, wiping out nearly 90% of all species. Could we then prevent that from occurring? Thanks to those hard-working, cutting-edge, busy people at NASA, the answer is starting to appear more and more like it might be a yes. Although NASA has a plan to lessen the risk while simultaneously producing geothermal energy, it is not without risk and comes at an incredible cost of $3.5 billion. But it would be worth thinking about if it prevents scorching ash clouds from annihilating us. Yellowstone hasn't erupted in over 630,000 years. And while artificial intelligence is making an effort, there is no reliable way to predict when it will. It might happen tomorrow, or it might take another million years. But if we can't find a method to stop it early, it will at least eventually occur. While a full eruption of Yellowstone wouldn't kill many people, it would produce a 500-mile-wide ashfall that would cover the U.S. West and Midwest in more than four inches of ash. NASA's plan involves drilling deep holes into the supervolcano's caldera from sites outside of Yellowstone in order to gain access to the magma pocket that powers it. This is the dangerous part, because if it isn't successful, it could trigger, not prevent, an eruption. The rich agricultural area would be destroyed, and overnight, it would transform into desolate wastelands. Imagine not having access to both food and solar electricity to power your Teslas and electrical gadgets. What would you do if you were unable to operate your Tesla or mobile phones? Although initially digging the holes would be difficult, there have been precedents in other countries, including Japan's recent attempt to drill through the Earth's mantle and Iceland's Iceland Deep Drilling Project, IDDP, which will drill a three, one mile deep hole to access new deep underground geothermal energy sources that, once transmitted via an energy suitcase, are expected to be able to power the entire U.S. According to Brian Wilcox, a researcher at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL, the Yellowstone region currently leaks around 6 gigawatt in heat. By drilling in this manner, he continued, it could be used to create a geothermal plant, which generates electric power at extremely competitive prices of around $0.10 per kilowatt hour. In light of that, it would rank among the least expensive energy sources available, dealing another blow to the economy dependent on fossil fuels. According to NASA's concept, water would be channeled into the supervolcano and would eventually emerge as superheated steam at a temperature of around 662 degrees Fahrenheit, 350 degrees Celsius, which could be utilized to produce electricity. The new device would start cooling the magma chamber as it sucked heat from it, which would eventually reduce the likelihood of an explosion. According to NASA, installing the system would cost around $3.5 billion. Sources claim that NASA is only taking this bold concept into consideration because of the severe threat that a supervolcano like Yellowstone poses. Three times in the past, the Yellowstone caldera has erupted and each of those eruptions was orders of magnitude larger than the volcanic eruptions we often see now. That being said, it would likely take many years to determine whether NASA's approach was successful in reducing or even stopping the buildup of pressure, and even then, in the best-case scenario, it would take thousands of years to totally cool the caldera, but in thousands of years Yellowstone might power most of the U.S. Which would you choose? Less expensive electricity or mass extinction? I guess we know what choice you'll make. Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos about space.